Okay, so we are going to partake on a journey together. And it, it's actually going to be a difficult task, but I promise it's going to be both fun and rewarding. Um, but this actually, what, I, what I've been preparing, turned out to be much harder than I had anticipated or expected. Um, it's actually something that I had wanted to do for many years, and the upcoming church trip to Greece in a couple of months was the final push that I needed to bring this to the top of my list and to finally get it done. So what am I talking about? What are we going to do? We are going to look at the life of Paul throughout the book of Acts, and we're going to follow his travels throughout his post-conversion life. And we're also going to tie in Paul's letters throughout the book of Acts. Now, I always thought that this would be fairly easy to do. Um, I just assumed that there would be many resources that would simply lay this out for the person seeking this information. And so because of that assumption, I just added this to my incredibly long theological to-do list, and I just never got around to it. Well, now that I'm finally getting around to it, uh, when I set out to do this, I quickly discovered that this was not as easy as I thought it was going to be. This is actually not an easy task. Now, I'm going to read a comment for you from someone online, which I think will be interesting. And this comment came in a theological group that I'm, that I'm in. And so I went into this theological group and I commented and I asked for resources that people have used to accomplish this task that I have set out to do. He responded with this. Good thought, but fraught with controversy, so much so that I gave up on the project. Wow. So he actually gave up on the project. That's how difficult this is. Now, if you know me, I love a challenge, and I rarely give up on something I want to do, especially something with this magnitude and importance. Now, you might be wondering why this is important to do, meaning understanding Paul's travels and when Paul wrote his epistles and where he was when he wrote them. It's actually very important. When we are done, your biblical studies will be forever improved. The historical context that's taking place behind Paul's epistles, and by the way, Paul's epistles make up a very large percentage of the New Testament. The context make them come alive in, an, in a new way, and it gives you a much deeper understanding of them. Now, Paul was a very wise man. How do we know this? Well, I'm going to tell you how I know it personally. He wrote 2,000 years ago, almost 2,000 years ago, and I still struggle to this day to understand things that he was writing. That's how wise Paul was. So let's go ahead and dive in, and I would encourage you to take notes, even, even in your Bible if you like to do that, so that when you're reading through the book of Acts or in one of Paul's epistles, you'll just have a note handy there to remind you of the historical context. Now, one quick note before we start. Skeptics, they like to point out the difficulties and the inconsistencies in Scripture, and then they claim that those mean that the Bible is not reliable and that it's not a legitimate source of ancient history, okay? Now, we are going to find difficulties along this journey together, and I'm going to tell you right now that I do not agree with their conclusion. So I don't believe that the difficulties lead to the conclusion that the Bible is unreliable or that the Bible is false. I come to a very different conclusion. 
Now, if the Bible, especially the book of Acts and Paul's epistles, were just made-up stories to convince everyone of this new religious sect that we now call Christianity, I don't think we would find these difficulties. I don't think we would have them. These issues that we come across, in reality, they give the Bible a flavor of realism. Think about that. When you're reading any ancient history, not just the Bible, there's always difficulties. There's always inconsistencies. Sometimes they're just blatant. For example, when I was uh, preparing for my Herod the Great sermon, and I was reading Josephus, there was just contradictions, like on someone's age. And I'd go check it out, or I'd read a footnote or whatever, and they're just like, yeah, we don't know why this is. It's probably just a mistake that he made. So the Bible is not fiction, and so we expect these things. Think about this. Imagine yourself or someone else writing a book series or a movie series. Okay, we're talking fiction here. Do you realize, if you have not ever, you know, done that or accomplished that, do you realize how much brain power they spend making everything fit together perfectly and avoiding any incongruences? It's a lot. And even then, sometimes there's still an issue. Now, this isn't related to Paul or Acts, what I'm about to say, but I wanted to say it anyway, mostly just to capture it, right? We're recording the sermon. It'll go on YouTube and everything. Skeptics, they claim that the Gospels were copied and plagiarized from a single source. You may not know that. That's a big deal. They pretty much all claim that today. The four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, were copied and plagiarized from a single source, and therefore, they claim that the Gospels are not independent records of those events. Okay? Now, here's what I want to point out. Those same skeptics claim that the Gospels are replete with contradictions. Did that sink in? <laughs> I don't see why, but they don't even see that those two ideas are contradictory. They claim they're all copied from a single source, and then they claim they're re replete with contradictions. So it's fascinating. What the reality is they're looking for any possible way to discredit the Bible, and they don't even realize the different things that they come up with to make up to discredit the Bible are actually contradictory to one another. So I will be pointing that out to them soon. All right. To begin our journey, we are going to start in Acts chapter 7. This is the first mention in the Bible of the man that we know as Paul, whose Hebrew name was Saul. Now, it's commonly believed that Saul's name was changed to Paul after his conversion, but that is inaccurate. Saul was his Jewish name, and Paul was his Latin name as he was a Roman citizen. Now, as we'll see in the story... Jesus referred to him by his Hebrew name, Saul, which I think is incredibly fascinating. So, please, open your Bibles to the book of Acts, chapter 7. Now, as a reminder, the book of Acts picks up right where the Gospels end. It's essentially a seamless transition. The Gospels, the four Gospels, end with the resurrection, and so the book of Acts begins with the resurrected Christ shortly before he ascends back to heaven. So the order of the four Gospels followed by Acts as the start of the New Testament is something I can get behind, but the order of the books after that is good but not perfect, as we will see. So book of Acts Let's fast forward to Acts chapter 7. We are obviously now after Christ's ascension to heaven, which happens in Acts chapter 1. And so to give us some historical context of what's going on, the followers of Christ, this would be both the disciples and the apostles, are now without their Messiah and their Lord. 
which was, if you think about it, probably not a great place to be. Think about this. Jesus was their teacher. He was their mentor. He was their heavenly guide. They went to him for answers. He corrected them when they needed it. He taught them about God the Father. The list goes on and on. Losing Jesus, if you really think about this, and I did in preparation for this, losing Jesus was undoubtedly just as hard for them as losing a close loved one. So with that historical background in mind, let's read Acts chapter 7 to get an introduction to this man named Saul. Now at the beginning of Acts 7, Stephen is in front of the high priest as men lied about him, claiming he spoke against the law and that Jesus would change the Mosaic law. By the way, this is a textbook definition of bearing false witness against your neighbor. This is important. When you make a false statement against your neighbor, claiming he or she did something that they did not do or said something that they did not say, that is what bearing false witness is. So here's a perfect example of what the Ten Commandments tell us not to do. And so Acts 7 begins with Stephen defending himself to the high priest against these false accusations. And he gives, this is kind of cool, he gives a mini Bible study to the high priest. I just love that. And the Bible study is actually really fun to read. But we're not going to read it now because it's not the topic of our current study. But just so you know, Stephen's Bible study in Acts 7 actually shines uh, a light on many things in the Old Testament. We actually learn some things and get a better understanding and picture of Old Testament events through his Bible study. How cool is that? So at the end of his Bible study to the high priest, you, you will see that Stephen becomes impassioned and he rebukes the Jews for murdering Christ. That is how this that is how his Bible study ends. And so we will begin reading at this part of the story, which is verse 54 of Acts chapter 7. Verse 54. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart and they gnashed at him with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God and said, look. I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice, stopped their ears, and ran at him with one accord. And they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. And they stoned Stephen as he was calling on God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he knelt down and cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Incredible story. Absolutely incredible story. So the death of Stephen serves as the introduction to Paul. Now referred to here by his Hebrew named Saul, his Hebrew named Saul, he was a young man and he was clearly in support of the murder of Stephen. So real quick, imagine you are witnessing a murder about to take place and as you're watching this murder about to take place, you go to the murderers and you offer to hold the coats for them as they carry out their crime. Just put yourself in that position. That is what Paul did here. And so that this event undoubtedly emboldened Paul against Christians. And Christians, by the way, at this time, because they weren't called Christians yet, they were known as followers of the way. We'll talk about that more in a bit. 
So continuing now, since we finished Acts chapter 7, continuing in Acts 8, let's read the first three verses. Verse 1, now Saul was consenting to his death. At that time, a great persecution arose against the, the church, which was at Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering every house and dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. So Luke tells us what we already saw, which was that Paul was consenting to the death of Stephen in helping hold the coats of those who killed Stephen. You can just imagine, right? They, they, they want to they wanna kill Stephen, and so they start to remove their garments so that they're, it's, it's almost like today, like we think of like rolling up your sleeves, right? And, and here Paul is saying, oh, I'll, I'll hold those for you so they don't have to be on the ground so that you can do what you're going to do. Now, what also, what also transpires via this event, the stoning of Stephen, is we learn about a scattering of the early Christians who were in Jerusalem, and they were scattered to Judea and Samaria. And then we also learn in, the, in these three verses that Paul was on a mission specifically to imprison followers of Jesus. Now, we have a mention here in verse 1 of two geographical locations. You've probably heard me say this in the past, but I always try to pay attention to geographical mentions when I read the Bible. It really helps to have some sort of a visual in your mind as you're reading the story of the Bible. Just hearing a name or a location is fine, but if you can have a visual, any type of visual, geographically, it actually completely helps and opens up the story of the Bible. Now, while this doesn't always work, it often does, more, more often than you might think, which is if you're reading the Bible and you come across a geographical location, just search it in Google Maps. Just open up Google Maps and search the geographical location. You'd be surprised how often it works. Now, the most recent location that I just searched for in Google Maps was the city of Philippi, and it came right up in northern Greece today. So, what are the three geographical locations mentioned in Acts 8.1? They are Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria. Now, Jerusalem, we're all familiar with, right? And that would show up, right, on a Google map search instantly. Now, while Jerusalem is and was a city in Israel, Judea and Samaria were not cities. So, this could be easy to miss especially if you're just learning the Bible when you're young. Judea and Samaria were regions, not cities. So to give you something to compare it to today, the closest thing I could come up with are counties, right? We have states, but then in the states we have these counties and there's cities inside the counties. So these regions in Israel would closely represent counties today, at least geographically speaking. And so what does this mean when it says that a persecution arose against the church in Jerusalem and they were scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria. What does, this, what does this mean? Well, once we get a visual, geographically speaking, it's going to open up the meaning of what this is talking about. So Jerusalem was in the region of Judea and the region of Judea was in the southern part of Israel. Now, I've never been able to fit, like, remember all of this. And so I was bound and determined to come up with a, a way for all of you to easily remember this. And I came up with one. So I'm super happy. This is going to be an easy way to remember the three regions in Israel at the time of Christ and the first Christians. So we're going to go ahead and pull up a map here for everyone to see. So this map that you're looking at right now should be recognizable to everyone. This is the country of Israel. 
and surprise, this is from Google Maps. Now, there are some landmarks. I, I don't know about your eyesight, but there are some landmarks that should all be very noticeable in this picture that you're looking at. And I'll give you a hint. They are all bodies of water, okay? Now, the very large body of water on the left side of the picture, which is the west side of Israel, that's the Mediterranean Sea. That's an important piece here. The little body of water on the north side of Israel that you can see there, that is the Sea of Galilee. Now, we would classify that as a lake today, but it's a very large lake, and back then they referred to it as the Sea of Galilee. I still call it the Sea of Galilee. And then the body of water to the direct south of the Sea of Galilee, just go straight down until you hit the next body of water that you can see, that is the Dead Sea. Those are our three bodies of water. Now, by the way, the reason that you see land in the middle of the waters is because the Dead Sea is shrinking very fast. Um, the reason why it's shrinking is due to another key water landmark in Israel, which is the Jordan River. See, the theme here is water. Now, the Jordan River, which you cannot see on this picture, it's easy to know where it is because it flows from north to south from the Sea of Galilee to the Dead Sea. In between those two bodies of water is the Jordan. Here's the problem. Both Israel and the country of Jordan, which are neighboring countries, uh, Jordan is the neighbor to the east, they both have rights to the Jordan River. So they, they kind of both own the Jordan River today, and so they're both using the water for their countries, for crops, etc. And so the Dead Sea no longer is, is getting the water that it needs to remain the Dead Sea. And so if nothing changes, the Dead Sea will be no more. And I don't see anything changing. By the way, it shrinks, the Dead Sea shrinks four feet per year. When we're talking about a body of water that small, shrinking four feet per year, that is very significant. So here is what I came up with for you to easily remember the three regions in Israel during the time of Christ. What are the three regions? They are the Galilee, Samaria, and Judea. And so we can use the bodies of water to remember the regions, generally speaking. So Galilee is the region to the west of the Sea of Galilee. So the, the, the main region to the west of the Sea of Galilee headed to the Mediterranean, that's the Galilee region. Samaria, that's the region to the west of the Jordan River, which you'll remember is between the Sea of Galilee and the Dead Sea, so you can just visualize that on your map. Look at that area between the two, from the Jordan River west to the Mediterranean, that's the, that's the Samaria region. And then Judea is the region to the west of the Dead Sea, which you can see on the map. And so all three of these regions essentially go west to the Mediterranean Sea. Now, these three regions did not cover the totality of Israel, of the land of Israel, but they did cover a majority of it. Um, like, for example, the north region, Galilee, that didn't extend all the way to the far northern region of Israel, and Judea on the south, that didn't extend <clears throat> all the way to this far southern end of Israel. So just remember that these three regions cover a majority of Israel with the exceptions of the fur furthest northern and southern ends. Now, getting back to the text, when we read that the disciples were scattered from Jerusalem into Judea and Samaria, we now know that this means they went north and south of Jerusalem. Now, obviously, they went east and west as well, but Israel's like this skinny country, right? And so we just imagine the scattering now is going north and south, north into Samaria, south into to Judea. Um, so remember, I mentioned Jerusalem is in Judea, but it's at the very north side of Judea. And so south of Jerusalem would be deeper into Judea, north of Jerusalem would be into Samaria. 
Now, I have a way for you to remember where Jerusalem is, okay? Even though you can look it up on Google Maps. Jerusalem was and is at the same latitude as the north end of the Dead Sea. This is a reason we don't need the Dead Sea to keep shrinking. Helps us know where Jerusalem is. So if you go to the top of the Dead Sea on the map and you just go straight west, halfway to the Mediterranean, you run smack dab into Jerusalem. That's where Jerusalem is. Top of the Dead Sea, go west, almost halfway to the Mediterranean, you're in Jerusalem. So this now paints a picture for us. The scattering from the believers, the disciples in Jerusalem it makes way more sense when we read that they were scattered into Judea and Samaria. As soon as they go north from Jerusalem, they're in Samaria. As soon as they go south away from Jerusalem, they're going further into Judea. That is what we're talking about. Now, let's fast forward to Acts chapter 9, which is our next mention of Paul, okay? And we're going to read the first 31 verses of the chapter. So verse 1 of Acts chapter 9 starts with this. Then Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found any who were of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. So Paul is still threatening Christians, and he goes to the high priest to get written permission to arrest any Christians in Damascus. Now, notice here it refers to the disciples as being of the way. As I mentioned briefly earlier, the way was the name given to the sect of Jews who followed Christ. Different sects inside of Judaism had different names throughout history, right? Like, for example, we know of a group called the Pharisees and the Samaritans. These are different sects, and so this particular sect of Jews who followed Christ in this time period were known as followers of the way. This is before they were called Christians. Now, what do we have? We have another geographical location here, which is Damascus. So we're going to need to go back to our map. But before I do, real quick, I had a skeptic within the last three months tell me personally that this mention of Damascus is not in Syria. How's that? <laughs> now, that caught me off guard. And I can't, this is a personality flaw that I have. When someone tells me something like that, I can't ignore it. I can't just be like, oh, you're silly. Because the reality is, I don't know, right? He's telling me something that might be true. I don't have the evidence to refute it, so I have to look into it. So I did look into it. You're welcome. And I discovered there is no reason whatsoever to conclude that this was not Damascus in Syria. We're talking zero reasons. There was no other Damascus, okay? And what's interesting about it is the lengths skeptics will go to attempt to discredit the Bible. They just make stuff up. By, by the way, you're, we're going to learn about Damascus. This is one of the most famous cities in the history of the world. All right, so here's another picture from Google Maps. You should be able to recognize Israel right away again. And the large country to the northeast of Israel, that's Syria. So northeast of Israel is Syria, that large country, way bigger than Israel. And then you can see Damascus. I put Damascus in the very middle of the picture to find it easy. And you're going to see that Damascus is in the lower left corner of Syria, which is just past the northern border of Israel, which is what we call the Golan Heights today. And so hopefully you can see Damascus is right there in the center of that picture. Isn't this coming together? Now we see why Paul wanted to go there. It's a major city. It's just north of Israel. And he wants to make sure that this, the, the way doesn't spread. Now, just to give you an idea of distance, I appreciate these types of things as well because they didn't have cars, they didn't have planes, they didn't have trains, right? So Syria, uh, Damascus specifically, is 133 miles northeast of Jerusalem. So 133 miles, presumably on foot. Now, Damascus, 
this city that we just read about in Acts 9, which is written almost 2,000 years ago, Damascus is the capital of Syria today, still today, the capital of Syria. And it's one of the oldest cities in the world. You guys ready for this? Damascus is mentioned in Genesis. Wow, that's how old Damascus is. Damascus, they believe, was most likely established by Noah's grandson. And there are references to Damascus outside the Bible going all the way back to the 15th century B.C. So this is a city with some serious history. All right, let's continue with verse 3 of Acts 9. As he journeyed, he came near Damascus. This is again Paul. And suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Then he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? Then the Lord said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goads. All right, since Paul was near Damascus, when this happens, he's most likely in Syria. If he was still in Israel, maybe, which is possible, he was probably in the nor northern region that you hear about today on the news, the Golan Heights. And as I mentioned previously, Jesus uses his Hebrew name, Saul. And I should point out here something interesting that you don't see in the English, but you can see in the Greek. Paul's response, who are you, Lord, was most likely not a reference to Jesus, okay? This is probably a lowercase Lord, lowercase L-O-R-D. So the Greek word kurios can mean Lord or Sir, and I don't think Paul knew immediately who was speaking to him, but it was such an extraordinary event that Paul responded with respect, meaning, who are you, sir? Who is speaking to me? And then I think this is why Jesus answers his question. He doesn't know. And he tells him exactly who he is. I am Jesus, who you are persecuting. Continuing, continuing with verse 6 of Acts 9. So he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Then the Lord said to him, arise and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. Now, this response, this is a response of humility from Paul. Think about it, right? He asks Jesus what he wants him to do, essentially immediately submitting to the fact that he's in the presence of the Lord. Wow. Now, the city here, when Jesus says, go into the city, as part of his instructions, the city is obviously Damascus, as that was where he was headed, and that was where he was near. And it's such a major city in the world. Now, quick little side note. We don't know if Jesus appeared to Paul here in bodily form, or if this was a vision or something else. I actually tend to think that Jesus did not come back to earth but rather spoke to Paul from heaven. And I think it was probably similar to Stephen's experience in Acts 7, where he said he looked up into heaven and saw Jesus standing at the right hand of the Father. Let's continue with verse 7 of Acts 9. And the men who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no one. Then Saul arose from the ground, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no one, but they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was three days without sight and neither ate nor drank. So what we have here is we have the beginning of the post-conversion life of Paul. I have been dealing with skeptics a lot. What is a skeptic? A skeptic is the term for somebody who does not believe in, in God. They don't believe in Jesus. They don't believe the Bible is true. They don't believe in miracles. That's what they call themselves. They call themselves skeptics. So I just call them that too. I'm not being degrading. I, I think it's good that they refer to themselves as skeptics because they are skeptical. And in my opinion, skeptical of things that are obviously true 
and obviously have evidence to back them. But um, <clears throat> be because I've been in that world, uh, and I'm tr I try to go for like the most difficult skeptics, right? I don't want easy skeptics. And so I have come to realize something new. And it's fascinating to me, and it makes what we're about to do together, studying this life of Paul after he's converted, way more exciting. I believe, other than Jesus, that's a given, I believe the two most important people that we have for our faith, especially in showing people who do not believe that the Bible is accurate, are Paul and Peter, big time. I think there's no one that's even a close third. So Jesus is super important. Jesus changed the world, right? He affected the world to this day. No one can escape Jesus, even if they want to try. If they, if they wake up and they write a date, that's because of Jesus, okay? You can't escape Jesus. But after that, Peter and Paul are incredibly important. And what, what we're going to see through this journey is they're actually, they're actually links on a chain, and so if we look at the story of the Bible, specifically the New Testament, the founding of the Christian faith, we are going to see that it is a chain. And I don't think skeptics can put a break in the chain. It's fascinating. And Peter and Paul are key, are key links in the chain getting us back to Jesus. So we are going to end here with Paul blind, met Jesus on the road to Damascus. He is now in Damascus. So his caravan brought him to Damascus. He cannot see, and it's interesting, but he's also not eating or drinking. We're going to find out why next Sunday. So let's go ahead and pray. Father in heaven, we just come to you today, and <clears throat> every time I study the Bible, I'm just so thankful to you for your word. And I'm thankful for this record that we have of events that men experienced, and they were so life-changing that they wrote about them. It's hard for us to understand how difficult it would have been to create a historical record back then, to share that record, and to preserve it <clears throat> 2,000 years later. Here we are. And uh, I just pray that we are able to understand the importance of Paul in your plan, for Christianity and the foundations of Christianity. I pray that we learn things that can be helpful to those who do not believe in these historical events, and I pray that we are able to see why you had such an impact on Paul's life and what we can learn from him, uh, who you had write practically half the New Testament. We pray this all in the name of Jesus. Amen.